are in the second to last week of our series in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament in chapter 7 this evening, uh, and our series is called Under the Sun. Next week is the season finale, and this evening we're going to go on a journey for the quest for wisdom. If you've been with us for the first seven weeks, you know that we have gone on several quests. The leader or the guide of this book, who is called the Koheleth, or we've referred to as the preacher, the professor, he is our guide through all of these different endeavors that we seek after as people. And so he's taken us on a quest, a quest for accomplishment, for morality, for justice, for happiness, for meaning. And this evening, he takes us on a quest for wisdom, something we all desire like the others as well, and we all seek to have as a part of our life. And before we jump in, it's very important to distinguish something, and that is that there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. So knowledge are facts or ideas that are learned through study, through research, through experience. There are facts and ideas that you have learned. Wisdom is the right application of knowledge. So knowledge is important. We all know that. It's important to study and to learn and to go through experiences so you can gain knowledge. But knowledge means very little if you don't know how to apply it rightly. That is where wisdom comes in. Wisdom is the right application of knowledge. And all of us want to apply the knowledge that we've acquired well. We want to do that in our jobs. We want to do that in relationships. We want to do that in investments. We want to do that in how we manage our time and our talents. We want to apply knowledge rightly. We want to be wise people. But wisdom can be elusive. It can be like chasing after a mirage in the desert. You never quite know whether or not it's a wise choice or you're living in a wise way because we face consequences of foolishness and foolish decisions that we make. So because we're so desirous of these things, we create uh, these life hacks. How many of you have some life hacks in your life? You know, I know you do. You have this thing, you're like, I figured it out. Like, I know how to, to navigate this, to do this, and and they, these apply to all different areas of our life. And I, I read about a life hack that I want to share with all of you that I think could be helpful, okay? Now, I want some participation on this. How many of you have moments in your life where you just want to have a night without interruption? You just want to be alone. You don't want to be interrupted. How many of you ever have those moments, right? A night, a weekend, you're like, it's been a lot. The last thing I want to do is, like, have a phone call and engage in some conversation, okay? You want to be just with your family, with a loved one. You just don't want him to be bothered. Now, how many of you also have people that call you often, that you know you need to answer, but you know it's going to be a long conversation? And on those nights, you don't want to engage in it, but you got to answer, and you're like, here we go. How many of you have those people in your life? Okay. I think most of us do. Some of you may have the people in the room, so you don't want to ra ra raise your hand, you know? You're looking at a friend, you're like, Hi, it's not you, I promise. <laughs> I have a life hack I read about. It says this. Next time you want to have one of those nights, and that friend calls, that boss calls, that coworker calls, you answer the phone like this. Hey, you're live on air. Now all of a sudden, they're terrified. Are you on a podcast? Are you on the TV? Where are you? Am I in a room? Am I speakerphone? What's going on? So typically what will happen, studies have shown, they'll go, oh, hi, okay, I'll call you back later. And then you just, you have the night to yourself. <laughs> so if some of you do that to friends in the room, then you know, okay? So you want to be careful. Make sure you know who's here before we leave. When we hang out at the end, you're like, okay, I can't do it to the people here. They know the hack. Here's another one I thought about. I don't know if this works, but I'm really intrigued. I have always been curious, interested in, and desirous of a 3D printer. I have no idea how they work. I don't even really know what one looks like. I think it looks like a printer, I, I imagine. But it prints things you can use. I, this is like baffles my mind. But here's a thought. What if I buy a 3D printer, I then print a 3D printer, and then return the 3D printer? <laughs> can that work? Because if it can, we're onto something, guys. 
We got a, a 3D printing side hustle, okay? If we can start doing that, who, the sky's the limit for us. But see, we have all these life hacks and these things that we consider, and, and some of them are helpful, and some of them actually provide benefits for our life. And, but deeper than that, we all desire to really live in a wise way. We want to have wise interactions with friends and with our coworkers and in work and in our investments and in the decisions we take and the opportunities that we take a hold of and the way that we just steward the knowledge that we have acquired and we will continue to acquire. But it can be elusive. And so the Koheleth tonight is going to take us on this journey for wisdom. And he's going to say something uh, that kind of frames everything. It comes in verse 12. And that is that this. It's that you must protect wisdom. You must protect it. Which means you are involved. You don't just arrive at wisdom. You have to be intentional with it. So verse 12, he says this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 12. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. So he's equating here wisdom and how you protect it to the same way that you protect money. Well, how do you protect money? Well, you budget. You seek wise counsel for how to use it, where to invest it. You consider the investments. Nobody just makes investments without thinking about it. You process it. You think about it. You reflect upon it. And you make intentional decisions. You spend time learning how to manage your money well. You also do consistent reflection. So maybe you reflect every day how you spent your money, every week, every month, surely every year. How are you managing your money? How are you protecting it? Thinking about 401k and building money till you get older and you can access that. There's all types of ways that we protect money. And I think there's three things that are consistent in the protection of money for every single person. And that is, one, you have to be intentional with your money. You have to really think about it, how you use it. You have to sacrifice time to learn about how to invest and how to use money and also listen to people that are experienced, that have wisdom and know how to apply the knowledge they have attained in terms of protection of money. So you sacrifice time to listen and learn. You're intentional and you reflect. You have to reflect your spending habits, what you value, what you prioritize, how your money's doing. See, it's important for us to understand this because it's the same thing with the protection of wisdom. This is what he's going to flesh out. As you are seeking after wisdom, it's going to require the very same things. Intentionality, sacrifice of your time to listen and to learn, and reflection. Reflection upon how you are living your life, the decisions you're making, the time that you invest. So how do you protect money? Now, I want to say that if you will listen tonight, I believe that you will learn how to find wisdom. Because Ecclesiastes 7 and some of the other passage, the passages that we go to are very clear. Now, here in chapter 7, the, the Koheleth, our guide in Ecclesiastes, he is changing his tactic. For the first several quests that we've been on, as I mentioned, accomplishment and money and uh, justice, happiness, meaning, he has kind of fallen a similar script. He presents a problem, and then he gives the solution. Well, the tactic here is completely different. Because he's going on a quest for wisdom in chapter 7, he's going to start launching these proverbs. Proverbs are short, pithy statements that convey wisdom. And so the very beginning of chapter 7, he starts out with this proverb, and he says this. A good name is better than precious ointment. Ointment is an, another way of saying perfume. So this is very clear. We're good with this. A good name, a good reputation, is better than perfume. Now, perfume may be good. It may be precious. You may enjoy it, but it is fleeting. It is what he's been saying. It's hevel. It's vain. It's temporary. It's good for a moment, and then it fades. But a good name lasts. That's important. It's better. Okay, we're tracking. This is good. The second half of verse 1, here's the other part of the proverb. And the day of death, better than the day of birth. You're like, whoa, hey, shock value. 
We went from a good name is better than perfume to the day of death is better than birth. Like, whoa, you really changed gears on me here. This is intentional. He's trying to shock you just so you see exactly what he's saying. Remember, he is bringing us on a quest for wisdom. And so what he is saying here, and he's going to flesh this out, is that the reason that the day of death is better than the day of birth is because death has much more to teach you about wisdom. Because death and birth are completely different experiences. Because they convey very different things and they affect you very differently. So for instance, birth is expansive while death is narrow. Birth is expansive. It is all about excitement. It is good times. It is laughter. It is joy. It is imagining the possibilities of the child that you're celebrating. Who will this child become and what will happen in this child's life? It is all about the feels. It's a good time. It's imagining memories. It's a celebration. While death is the exact opposite. It is very narrow. It's not expansive. It's not looking out and imagining what it lies ahead. It is focusing you in. It is about reflection. It is processing how you've lived your life, the decisions you've made, what priorities you have had, which opportunities that you didn't take advantage of that you should have. Most of us here, I would imagine, have been to a funeral or memorial service before. And there's all types of reflection that takes place, reflecting on the person's life that has passed away. But there's also reflection that happens among everyone that's there. As you begin to think, how am I living? And you hear stories about how they made wise decisions and how they took advantage of certain opportunities. And it causes you to think, I need to start living like that. And I need to start making those changes in my life. Very different experiences, birth and death. And he's going to say, as he develops this and deepens it in verse 4, that the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Mirth is amusement or laughter. So to kind of drive the point home, he says, those that are wise, those who have a heart of wisdom, they are in the house of mourning. They are in a place where death has occurred. Whereas the fool, the foolish person, is just simply in the house of laughter. They're just in the place of excitement. He's developing this death and birth juxtaposition further. Now, we have to be really clear what he's saying here. He's not saying, so you can breathe easy, he's not saying if you want to live a wise life, if you want to be a person of wisdom, well, you can't have fun. You know, you just got to be in the house of mourning all the time. You got to be locked away. You got to be sad. You got to be down. You got to be reflecting like a philosopher or a monk just kind of locked away. He's not saying that. If you've been with us for the past seven weeks, you know that he has encouraged people time and time again to enjoy life, to see the things in your life as gifts from God for you to enjoy. He says that you are to look upon the good of your life, be content and be grateful and enjoy the days that you have. So he's not saying that wise people can't enjoy life or that they don't enjoy life. Here's what he's saying. Wise people are not consumed with only ever having a good time. They are also in the house of mourning. They are also reflecting, processing, asking questions about their life. Whereas the fool is only ever in the place of laughter. All they want is to have a positive experience and a good time. So to, if I wrote this proverb in modern day language, I would say it like this, okay? The fool is concerned with FOMO, fear of missing out. They're consumed with that. They're just concerned about missing out on a good time because life is all about good times. I just want to be in the house of laughter. I don't want to be in a place of mourning. Whereas the wise person is consumed with Foul, F-O-W-L, fear of wasting life. Two different fears. Missing out on a good time or wasting your life. See, this is the, the parallel that he's drawing between the wise person and the foolish person. The wise person is reflective. They consider their life. They're fearful that they're going to waste their life as 
whereas the fool is just concerned with having a good time. They just want to be in the place of laughter. They just want to be excited. They just want to imagine possibilities and not really dive deep in reflection. And so what he's going to develop here is that it's really dangerous if you don't understand that difference and you don't even analyze yourself on which side of the coin you fall in in the moment because one will lead to wisdom and the other will lead to foolishness. See, he, what he's pushing forward towards us is what drives your life. As you think about how you live each and every day, what drives your life? Is it having a good time or is it having a purposeful time? Is it the fear of missing out or is it the fear of wasting your life? Do you shun anything that is narrowing and focusing and causes reflection in you? What drives your life? See, what he's saying here is very similar to what the psalmist says in Psalm uh, chapter 90, verse 12. He says this, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days, to think about our days, to reflect upon our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Not just to go through your days and just speed through it, trying to get what's ahead because your life is expansive and it's all exciting and it's just good times. No, teach us to stop, reflect, and number our days because then we find wisdom. See, what he's going to drive home now is that the way that you protect wisdom is through reflection. Reflection is protection. How do you protect wisdom? You become a person of reflection because reflection is protection. Here's the problem, though. Reflection requires two things, that we embrace two things, and these two things we don't readily embrace. They are obstacles for us. These two obstacles are silence and sorrow, two things that we avoid two things that we don't take hold of or we try to run away from, silence and sorrow. But because reflection is protection, these things must be embraced. So the first one, silence. We are afraid of silence. I just want to say we're afraid of silence because our noise is so, our world is so noisy. Many of you work in Brickell or you live in Brickell. If you are going from point A to point B, how many times do you walk without listening to something? How many times do you drive your car without listening to something? Here, here's, here's an exercise. If you are home alone, no one's there, you're all alone, how many times are you in your house or your condo, your apartment, and it's completely silent? No Alexa, play jazz. No TV on. No phone call with someone. Just completely silent. Can you remember the last time? just completely silent. We, our world is so noisy and we're so used, you're so, we're so used to just being around noise and stimulated all the time that silence is something that we are afraid of. So I want to do an exercise. You ready to do an exercise? Okay, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to close our eyes and be silent. So I want to ask you to just close your eyes right now and just be silent. Silent. How'd that feel? How many of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, how many of you opened your eyes? You're like, what's going on? If those of you online, if you just joined in that moment, you're like, what's happening? Did he freeze? Why is it so quiet? And here's the thing. Do you, you know how long we were just silent for? 25 seconds. Some of you are like, that felt like two minutes. What's going on here? See, silence is something we avoid because kind of makes us feel vulnerable, causes us to really be in our head, to think, to reflect, to hear what's around us, to be present in the moment. And some of us are afraid to do that, to really embrace that. And if you've embraced it, then that's great because that's an, an important aspect of 
gaining wisdom, is embracing silence. The scripture is full of encouragement for you to be silent. In fact, Proverbs, which is written by the same author as Ecclesiastes, Solomon, Proverbs says that the man of understanding keeps silent. The person who has understanding and wisdom, they keep silent. See, silence and wisdom go hand in hand. In fact, there's been so many instances in Scripture where you are called to be silent before God. When is the last time that you have come before God with just silence? No worship music, no background music, no podcast, no sermon you're listening to, nothing. Just silence before God. Because there's all types of imperatives in Scripture that call you to be silent before God. See, silence has to be embraced if you want to find wisdom. You have to be intentional about that. Sacrifice time to embrace silence. And secondly is sorrow. We avoid sorrow at all costs. We are afraid of silence, but we avoid sorrow at all costs. We want a positive life. We use that all the time. I just want a positive experience. I just want positive relationships. I just want a positive work environment. I just want a positive church. I just want positive everything. And when something's negative, what do we do? We work really hard to turn it positive. We, we don't want to embrace sorrow. If there's something that's causing sorrow, we try to turn it. We try to fix ourselves. And sorrow can be, you know, found in many different places. It can be as this author of Ecclesiastes, the Koheleth, is saying at the day of death or the house of mourning, when a loved one is passed, but it can also be found in kind of day in, day out, a really hard day at work. You know, a harsh word that someone said, a struggle with anxiety or depression, conflict in a relationship. There could be sorrow that is found in many different places. And, and oftentimes what we do is we try to compartmentalize or we try to avoid it because we don't want to embrace it. We just want a positive life. But we have to embrace sorrow. If we're going to find wisdom, here's what he says in verse 3. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. Isn't that interesting? Remember, again, he's talking about wisdom. He's not saying laughter is bad. He's saying as you're on a quest for wisdom, if you want to discover wisdom, sorrow has much more to teach you about wisdom than laughter. It is better than laughter. It must be embraced if you're going to find wisdom. And then he says in the second half that when your face is full of sadness, your heart can be turned glad. That seems like an impossibility. Wait, wait. When I'm embracing sorrow, when I'm in a moment of sorrow, and I've had a tough day, a tough week, a tough year, when I embrace that, even though I have a sad face, I can have a glad heart? How is that possible? You know, one person who embraced sorrow and saw this to be true is King David. He wrote the vast majority of the Psalms, and many of the Psalms that he wrote were Psalms of lament, of sorrow. There's a very famous Psalm, Psalm 22, where he starts out and he says this, my God, my God, why have you, do you know the word? Forsaken me. Now remember, David is the anointed king of Israel, yet he cannot assume the throne because Saul will not relinquish his position. And so he is being hunted For over 10 years, hiding in caves and running from city to city, fearful of his life. As he knows he's the anointed king, he lives a life of sorrow for over a decade. And he feels like God has forsaken him. And he's honest. Remember, the embracing of sorrow is not just when you had a hard moment or a difficult relationship or there's something that's happening in your life. It's also embracing sorrow that you may feel in your relationship with God. Saying, God, I feel like you're not listening. I feel like you've forsaken me. Embracing that and bringing that to bear, even in your prayer life, as David says in Psalm 22. But listen, because David embraced sorrow, he didn't just try to turn sorrow to become something positive. In the very same chapter where he's talking about how he feels like God has abandoned him and forsaken him, he says this. Psalm 22, verse 24. He says, for he, this is God, has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. See, here's what he says. He starts out by saying, God, why have you forsaken me? 
And at the end of the prayer, at the end of the psalm, he says, God, I know that you've heard me. I know that you're with me. I know that you see my affliction and you're near to me. I know that you have not turned your face from me. See, even though his face is full of sadness, his heart is glad because he's embraced sorrow. He doesn't hide it away. He brings it to bear in his relationship with God and certainly is honest about it in his life. You see, the the protection of wisdom requires reflection, and two of the greatest catalysts for reflection are silence and sorrow. And if you don't embrace those, and if you're not intentional and sacrificial about placing those within your life, you will struggle to discover wisdom, which you're made for. So you're made to discover wisdom. That's what the Kohelis says at the very end here of chapter 7. In verse 29, he says, See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. See, he says that you were made to live upright. You were made to follow God's standards. You were made to seek after wisdom. Wisdom is from the Lord, and so you're made to live a wise life, an upright life. And as I've said, it requires protection of wisdom, which requires reflection upon your life. And the two things that bring about reflection greater than really anything else is silence and sorrow. But here's the problem for us. Though we are made to discover wisdom, the second half of that verse is true, where it says this, we, but they have sought out many schemes. Though We are made to discover wisdom and to live upright. We have sought out many schemes. We fall for foolishness. We don't always apply knowledge rightly. In fact, he fleshes this out in verse 25 and 26. And I I love the way that he develops this because it's, it's, it's very visceral. It really strikes your mind. As he's talking about his own quest and the schemes that he encountered for himself. Verse 25 and 26, he says this. I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom in the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. Saying, I was seeking after wisdom. I wanted to see the scheme of things and I wanted to see the foolishness that is wickedness. I wanted to kind of really see it, understand it so I could avoid it so I could have a wise life. Verse 26, and I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters or chains. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. He said, I've been on this quest for wisdom, and I'm trying to see the schemes of things that try to lure you away from wisdom and into foolishness. And I want to see how wicked foolishness is. And I saw something that is more bitter and is worse than death. And that is Lady Folly. See, in the book of Proverbs, Solomon develops Lady Folly. She is the personification of foolishness. Now, the first thing you may be saying is, why a woman? Well, here's why. Because Proverbs is written from a father to a son. And so as the father is telling his son in the book of Proverbs that he needs to avoid foolishness, and he needs to be mindful of foolishness and and its tactics, he uses a woman to convey that because the way that he constructs the imagery of this woman, Lady Folly, in in chapter 7 of of the book of Proverbs, is that she is seductive. She is, he says, a woman of the night that looks to take her victims in, and and her, her talk is very smooth, and she's very flattering. And she's patient as she waits for her victims. But she's also loud and abrasive. And she wants to smooth talk you to follow her down her path. As Proverbs is conveying the seductive and tempting and flattering nature of foolishness, here in Ecclesiastes, Solomon wants to say that this is who she really is. Just in case you're not aware... She, foolishness, 
She is a woman whose heart is snares and nets. She wants to ensnare you. She wants to catch you with her nets. And her hands, what is reaching for you, are chains. She wants to chain you. She wants to enslave you. She wants to engulf you in her nets. These are the schemes of foolishness that will try to pull you away from wisdom. Isn't that visceral imagery? And he's saying, be mindful of these things. How do you escape her? How do you not go down a path of foolishness? Because it's always reaching for you. It's seductive. It's flattering. It's telling you you're so great. It's telling you this is the best. It's very patient with you and sometimes very loud and abrasive too. How do you go in the opposite direction of foolishness and head towards wisdom? Second half of the verse 26 says, those who please God will escape her, but the sinner is taken by her. Okay, so what does it mean to please God? Well, remember, we're on a quest for wisdom here. What does it mean to please God? That is to seek wisdom. And we talked about already that you're to protect wisdom, that you're to reflect in your life, and some of the things that can bring about reflection is silence and sorrow. And we're saying that protection of wisdom is very similar to the protection of money. You have to be intentional. You have to sacrifice time to listen and to learn. You have to reflect daily, weekly, monthly, annually upon your life, upon the wisdom, how you're applying knowledge. But is, is that simply what it means to please God? It does mean to seek wisdom. But because we have the whole counsel of Scripture, we can see very clearly what that is. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Listen to this. I'm going to read this together. It says, for God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be what? Wisdom. Say it out loud with me. God made him to be what? Wisdom itself. God made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. The Apostle Paul says this. Do you want to know how you seek wisdom? Do you want to know where you begin on your path to wise living, you have to begin with Jesus because God made Jesus wisdom. Wisdom is a person. And wisdom must be a person for you before it can become a pursuit. Before you try to pursue wisdom in your work and in relationships and in your endeavors and the opportunities that you take a hold of in your life, you must see that wisdom is a person. The person of Jesus. God made Jesus to be wisdom itself. And so if wisdom is the right application of knowledge, what is the knowledge that you are to apply to your life? Well, the second half of verse 30 gives you the answer. That Jesus made you right with God, that you are pure and you are holy and you are free of sin. That is the knowledge you are to apply to your life. And so what does that mean in the context of Ecclesiastes 7? It means that you are no longer ensnared and captured by Lady Folly. You don't have to be. You are not taken by her. You are taken by Christ. You are set free. You are pure. You are holy. You are made right with God. You are no longer right with Lady Folly. Though you may fall to her traps, you are never stuck there. You are free of foolishness and sin. You see, wisdom is a person, and wisdom must become a person for you before it can become a pursuit in your life. And what do we see in the person of Christ as he has become wisdom itself for us? What are two things he embraced? Silence. You know, when he was accused, falsely accused, it said that he was what before his accusers? Silent. He embraced it. And he is also called the man of what? Sorrows. He embraces silence and he is called the man of sorrows. You see, as we are journeying on a path towards wisdom, as we've been made to live upright and to find wisdom, it begins with Jesus. It begins with us looking at the person of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the promises of Jesus. And that as we begin to look upon him, as we put aside our time, 
to listen and to learn from him, as we're intentional, as we reflect upon him, we will see our life become a life of wisdom. We will see us move farther away from Lady Folly and into the reality that is already true of us if you are in, in Christ through faith. And that is that you are pure and you are holy and you are free of sin and you are made right with God. Wisdom is a person. And because wisdom is the right application of knowledge, you know what that means for you? You want to know how you find wisdom and how you live a wise life? Wise living is the right application of your knowledge of Christ. It is the right application of your knowledge of Christ. In any scenario in your life where you are seeking after wisdom, what do I do? What do I say? How do I engage? How do I handle that email? How do I talk to my boss? How do I engage that conflict? What do I believe when my mind is telling me something completely different? Wisdom begins with you saying, I'm going to apply my knowledge of Christ into this situation. And that is why it is so vital that you continue to grow your knowledge of who Jesus is because you can only live wise if you're applying the knowledge of Jesus into your life. Because Jesus is wisdom itself. And so for us, we are called to live upright. But that is not in our own effort. You are not wise because you try really hard. You can't just, you can't just leave tonight and say, you know what? I'm going to live wise this week. I'm going to make all the right decisions. Because we fall prey to the seductive and flattering speech of Lady Folly. We make poor decisions often. But what you can say is, I want to follow Jesus this week. I want to live wise by putting aside time, sacrificing time, and reflecting upon who Jesus is. And trusting that God is going to use that to bring wisdom into my life and every pursuit that I'm in. Part of that means also embracing silence and sorrow as it comes so that you might think about your life and who Christ is as well. That's why death is better than birth because one of the things that death does more than anything else is it causes us to reflect on who God is and what our life is all about. And we find that in the person of Christ. So I pray that you would live wise this week, not because you're just gonna try really hard, because you're going to seek Jesus, who is wisdom itself. Will you pray with me?